All right, hey everybody, and welcome to Chew Stream. I am your host, Bobby Chu, and I also have on here my co host, Ms. Seiseki. Hello, everyone. And Matt Johnson. Hey, everybody, what's going on? Right on. So, this is a stream all about art and life as an artist. And, uh, you know, I'm doing some painting today. And the special thing about this uh, stream, which, you know, gotta make things special all the time, is the fact that I'm streaming a live, like a real painting, not the fake paintings, like <laughs> digital art. You know, this is this yeah. with real analog, just water and a bunch of paint and a bunch of hair stuck on a stick, and I'm going to make some art <laughs> for you guys. I think it'll be fun. This actually is a painting that is for uh, a new book that's coming out that's also very special. It's actually Massey's very first book. Yeah. So it's called Kin. Um, it's about family and all the wonderful kind of ways to kind of show family and stuff. Um, I like it. I really like it. Not just because of the art, but because of the message and how heartfelt it all looks. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And alongside my book, your book is coming out too. Yes, yes, that is going to be fun. I haven't put out a new book in a very long time. Um, and so my book is about unusual unicorns. And uh, there's actually just a few books left. There's just a few of Massey's books left. That's why I'm not like doing some big advertisement <laughs> over uh, the Kickstarter. We're pretty much done, and we had 500 books, and we are almost sold out of 500 books. Yeah. Um, next time you can get the books is probably we'll, we'll have some at Comic-Con, and, and I think uh, that's about it. Maybe some workshops and things will bring them. Yeah. But that's about it. So if you did pledge, then good for you. You got in. <laughs> Consider yourself one of the lucky, one of the lucky ones. So, anyhow, um, I'm excited to get my books, and I wanted to just say real quick, like you guys put together such an awesome set of packages. It's just really cool, all the different uh, little reward tiers and everything like that, and the book already being ready to go. Like the fact that we're gonna all get our books pretty soon. I think that's really neat. I think that's really cool. So, so congratulations, kudos to you guys. Oh, hey, thank thanks. You. Didn't even know that you that you were aware of the Kickstarter, so that's pretty awesome. We yeah. haven't talked for a while because I've been traveling for like three weeks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't put out a book in literally I think like three years, and every time I look at my old book, even though I still kind of like it, I'm I'm getting more and more disgusted of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a natural thing, no? Yeah, maybe so. How did you guys come up with the concepts? I'm curious because it feels like Unusual Unicorns is very specific and Ken is like a very general idea. I think that's kind of neat the way the books complement each other. You want to start with, you know, how you came up with your topic? Or you? Yeah, sure. Um, well, Ken is pretty much, um, yeah, it's a bigger uh, concept where, you know, it's like it can go in so many ways. And I thought that because it can go in so many ways and I wanted to tell so many stories, I thought it was like the perfect way to kind of uh, put out my illustration, especially since it's my first book. And I think I just wanted people to connect, like I wanted my artwork to connect with people. So that was my main reason why I went with uh, a family art book. Right on. And I went with Unusual Unicorns because, um, you know, as a little child, I loved dragons, and I loved unicorns. I thought they were so majestic, so cool, so interesting. Dragons, I feel, remained interesting, remained cool. You know, there's How to Train Your Dragon, there's Pete's Dragon, there's a bunch of dragons. Unicorns, on the other hand, I felt turned the wrong way, where they became almost tacky. You know, a unicorn flying through the air with rainbows coming out of its, uh, you know, from the back of it or whatever. Um, you know, it just, it seemed tacky again. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to let my good friend, the unicorn, you know, go down like that. I'm going to do something about it. And so I figured, let's bring back the uniqueness, the awesomeness of the unicorn. So I made 
a whole collection of um, unusual unicorns because that's what they should be, you know, special, rare, sacred. That would be unusual. Mm -hmm. So that's been really fun, and we have some really great guest artists, uh, so I couldn't be happier. And so what I'm painting right now is my guest piece for Massey's Kin book, which also um, I figured... Let's just put it, put it in uh, real time so you can see exactly how slow everything is or whatever, maybe how quick everything is, hopefully. It seems slow to me, though. <laughs> yeah. It's compared to digital. I was learning from this incredible artist named Carcamo last year, with you, Masei, yeah. of course. Uh, had a really just once in a lifetime opportunity to learn from this guy and he makes me feel really slow you know everything he does is so precise so mm -hmm. minimal and looks so effortless yeah yeah effortless accurate it's especially his the way he paints water and the reflection and uh, it's it's just amazing I'm always blown away by his paintings you know that seems to be the pattern of things as well um, I don't know if this is a good kind of topic to really delve into, but it's something good to kind of mention. It's like the kind of evolution of an artist. I feel like generally we're all the same. We start to really respect people that are able to put down immense amounts of knowledge in a very simplified way. You know, like they could put down three brush strokes. You don't really know what's going on. They put down a fourth, a fifth, a seventh, an eighth. The twentieth brush stroke, you'd start to see a boat at, going down a channel, you know, <laughs> with a bunch of pirates about to jump on it. And then it all kind of snaps together and you're like, holy smokes. And mm -hmm. then if you rewind the tape a little bit or the video, I don't even know if some, some <laughs> people might be like, what's it? What do you mean rewind, oh, rewind the tape? Um, <laughs> But yeah, if you rewind the video a whole bunch, then you look at those initial brush strokes. That's talking about a lot of info with very minimal effort, which is amazing. All the efforts happening in the brain. Right? So something to really think about as you're painting the 70,000th hair on your beautiful panda bear that you're just like so excited over. A lot of like the really high level professionals will do that in like, you know, 30 brush strokes, mm -hmm. what takes a lot of other people 70,000. You ever stand beside, I don't know if you guys ever had this experience. I, like, I remember standing beside somebody that's really good and we're both doing life drawing. Uh, this was when I was a student. I'm trying to draw fast. Right? I'm moving my arm as fast as it'll go, <laughs> trying to get as many marks down or whatever. And then by the end of the two minutes, I look over. The other guy, he's just going super slow the whole entire time. Mm -hmm. I can see him through my peripheral vision. At the end, he has one, you know, one fifth or one tenth of the marks that I've made, yet he has much more of a complete image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's that accuracy, really. That's what happens, that, that accuracy. I remember being in figure drawing classes and you, you're you like frantic. You're like, oh man, this I've only got 30 seconds or I've only got a minute. And you're just like almost overwhelmed by that feeling of like, there's a whole person there and I gotta draw that entire person right now. And uh, then there's someone who's been doing it for a little while next to you. Like you're saying, Bobby, they're really relaxed and calm. And there's just something that looks fast about it when it's finished. That's what's really cool about those little short figure drawings. They look like they're moving slow. And I think I remember one of your drawings from a, a book. It was of a little girl, like, in a bathing suit, leaning over to wade in the water. It was in a uh, figure drawing, I think. Yes. And you had said, like, and that that drawing is made of, like, 20 marks. Yeah. That's it. And it's, like, this photorealistic, like, very, to me, it's very realistic. Not photorealistic, but it's just a realistic drawing you did. And I think the comment you made there was that it was about being accurate more so than about being fast yeah I, well over time um it's been nice to kind of 
be that other person, you know, sometimes when I go into like drawing class and stuff and I see <laughs> the other students frantically trying to like draw as fast as they can and I just look at it. I just look at the pose for a good like 30 seconds, take up like a quarter of my time and then I, as I'm doing that, I'm figuring out every move that I'm about to make and then I just do it nice and slow, nice and smooth and by the end of it, it does look like a more complete painting more That's so complete cool. drawing mm. but you know everybody can do that everybody can do that uh you just gotta put your focus towards the right things you know so if you keep thinking okay it's not about how fast i move my brush but about how fast i put down correct information with every brush stroke right mm. then you'll start drawing fast even though you're drawing kind of slow Boom, mm -hmm. mind blown. When I heard that first time, my mind was blown. Would you say, um, especially for life drawing, um, to in order to get those accurate lines, it requires a lot of like studying beforehand in order to achieve those, you know, accurate uh, lines. Yeah, yeah. Well, like you got to know what you're drawing, and then you got to know how life works. Right? Like, how, how does light work and all that stuff? Because light is the thing that describes the other thing that you should know how, it, you mm -hmm. know, the anatomy and all that stuff. Light just puts um, that information into a view where you can see it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I would say what a lot of people, they talk about fundamentals. If you're talking about just black and white drawing, um, for life drawing or something like that, you need to know structure. So you would need to know how the thing actually works, you know, whether it be a person or a tractor. You gotta know the general anatomy of it. And then after that, you gotta know how light works. And then after that, you use those two things and you think about the information you wanna put down and what, what information actually kind of crosses over each other has similarities you know so for example um the bathing suit thing that matt was talking about that was like i remember that drawing because i had a eureka kind of moment and i wish i had the drawing here somewhere but um maybe i'll i'll look for it later uh where i was i was painting I was drawing the the girl in the swimsuit and the swimsuit was lighter than her skin so what I did was and it was kind of like a one piece uh swimsuit so I did her shoulders and then I did her legs coming out of the swimsuit and then because of the pattern on the swimsuit I just did the pattern but I didn't outline the swimsuit I didn't bother because the information was already there mm -hmm. wherever the pattern ends and wherever those shoulders end wherever those legs start it forms an invisible line, right? So then all of a sudden, it's like those kind of things where us as artists, a lot of times we'll look at it and go, wow, that was, I like that. that. That was really good because it was effective and it was um, economical. Anyhow, why don't we go to one of the questions that all these people are writing in, Matt? Yeah, I, like, I do. I have a couple okay. of good questions here. Um, Crayon You asks, what is your favorite painting or drawing medium? Ooh, uh, right now, I'm, I'm going back old school. I just got myself a new pencil. And actually, I got myself a mechanical pencil because I usually use just normal pencils. Oh, is um, that what you bought today? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> why I went to the store today. Just a cheap $2 mechanical pencil. That's pretty standard. <laughs> yeah. Nothing magical. Yeah, nothing. And then I got um, some 2B.5 millimeter uh, lead for the pencil. So That's I'm cool. going to rock that out later. I'm going to do a bunch of the commissions for our Kickstarter with those. So oh, there you go. I've always been intimidated by drawing with a mechanical pencil. Uh, I don't know. I think... For me, what it was is that I didn't like drawing with the mechanical pencil. It felt like it, it went slower. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a bigger, when you just have a regular pencil, you can use the side of the pencil a lot, and that could cover a lot of ground very easily. 
so I really got into that, especially with subway sketching, where you need to draw quite quickly. Mm. So it's been a long time, but I'm looking forward to testing out that bad boy. That's cool. Mm. What about you, Missy? What's your favorite medium? I think watercolor is actually becoming my favorite over really? anything else. Yeah, it's there's something about it. I think um, the the quality of like the the look that you get for every stroke that you put down is something that you can't achieve ever again. So I think the originality of um, each painting that I come up with, whether it's um, you know good or not to my standards. I think it makes it really special and I that's what makes that's why I love you know Carcamo stuff is because it's it's just like <laughs> you know he even he can't uh replicate the exact same painting so I think there's that charm to it that is really cool when you really think about it there are no forgeries of watercolor paintings or at least I don't know if there are. I know there's going to be some people, oh, what about this one? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. But um, I could say, you know, for the most part, there are way fewer mm -hmm. forgeries of watercolor paintings if it's a known painting because how are you going to forge it? You know, water does what it does. And mm -hmm. you can try to control it as much as you can, but there's certain patterns, there's certain, you know, marks that it'll make that it's, that's nature painting and drawing and you're just guiding it a little bit which is another really cool thing mm, mm -hmm. it's like i bought a painting from nature <laughs> that is awesome what about you i got Matt? another oh uh my uh, definitely drawing i think I'll, I'll always be a fan of just a simple pencil and a sketchbook like i enjoy just doing right now i've been i, I feel like you can work on one painting for four hours or eight hours or something like that, but there's just a great satisfaction that comes out of a 15 minute little portrait of an alien or a monster that worked out well. And you didn't have to render it all the way and paint every pore on its face to feel like you really created something. You created some fun, uh, something that tickles your imagination. So um, yeah, I've just really enjoyed my quick sketches right now. That's, that's where mm. I'm at. I think it's also important to switch back and forth. Mm. You know, I was having this discussion with um, with another artist not too long ago, and we we're just talking about how now there's a lot of artists that can do speed paintings and it looks great. It's all speedy and stuff, but then you ask them to finish something and they can't finish it. And then, mm. yeah, and I'll get these portfolios where it's nothing but speed paintings. And then I'm thinking to myself, so who's going to finish your painting if I hire you? You know, is it, is it me? Do I, am I now the cleanup artist? Is that what's going to happen? And usually I, I, you know, I'm not down for that. So just for, you know, all the people out there making their portfolios and everything, uh, it is important. I've gotten a lot of jobs just because I know how to do, you know, the loose stuff to the finished stuff. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Very important. Yeah. Um, someone else asked a great question here. Helena, um, when you've been studying a specific subject for a long time, when is it a good time to change subjects or let that rest for a while? Mm. Mm. There should be a minimal time. I feel like I'm not sure what the maximum time would be. And who knows? It could be, it could just keep going. But um, minimal time. I feel like three months because otherwise you're going to spend, you know, one month, two months working on something, trying to figure it out. You don't really get it. You move on and you didn't bring anything with you. You know, you didn't actually learn anything that you can take to the next job. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you spend three months, you will learn something and you will be able to take that somewhere else. Um, you know, if you think about it, this is some, I think, some cool stuff to think about. You know, artists, what do we do? We, we interpret life, right, in either literal ways, realism or whatever, or in stylized ways. But either way, even abstract art, it is influenced by life in some way or another. And then animated art, of course, that is very influenced from life as well. 
so in other words, we should be learning about different aspects of life. And whatever we are learning, whether it's scuba diving or uh, insects in, in the Congo or something like that, any one of these things, if you learn it, it will improve your art. You will take it with you wherever you go, and it will come out in one way or another. Right, So it's far more important not to find the thing that is kind of like the be-all, end-all of whatever it is you want to learn, but to just constantly learn stuff and bring it with you. Right, Learn it enough where you actually learn something. That makes sense to me. I think that um, all too often there's not a, a lot of focus with that learning, and you're just kind of like, kind of poking out in the dark trying to figure out how to get better at art but if you give yourself like a three-month course like in your own head like i'm going to learn how to do line work better then you're probably going to just focus on that and improve a lot more that's nice a lot of times when i'm interviewing artists as many of the the uh, you know watchers right now know um a lot of times they say especially the more veteran kind of people they say go live your life right Go out there, travel. A lot of people, they say travel. But if you kind of distill it down to its core, um, why? Why do we want to do all this stuff? It's because we are the people illustrating something that is influenced by life itself. So you got to go out there and you got to live life. Um, but going back to like a question I believe you are kind of saying before, you know, how do you come up with all these ideas of like, whether it's family or it's unique, you know, unusual unicorns? It's because as I'm experiencing life, I'm always on. I'm always thinking. I'm looking at everything as like, could that be a unicorn? Could that be a unicorn? Could that be a unicorn? <laughs> I do the same thing with films, right? If I'm on a film, all of a sudden that becomes my life. And I think of everything as like, could that be an alien? Could that be an alien or whatever? And that's why I'm not that good at um, working on multiple projects at one time. Because you, know, you just are. need to focus. You need, yeah, you need I need to, to just like, be on. Your... I need to be yeah. on all the time on that one thing. Do you think it's the same for you, Masse? Sorry, uh, the... Like that idea of needing to focus on one thing. Yeah, I, I would say I, I do rather put my focus on one thing because eventually if I work on two things they kind of start like meshing in together and weaving in together and then it bleeds into each other and then that's where I I'm not like super satisfied with uh both both of the projects <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've had that before <laughs> that's funny yeah but cool. you, you know what's funny um so the most recent project I uh that we've worked on there was a part where um, I focused more on the fabric, and then after I noticed, after I started doing that, I started looking at like little details, like oh, how does my shirt work, or like how does this button work? It's like oh, there's the seam. It's like I never really thought about it until it was get that task was given to me. So it made me really think on my personal work or my own time. Those are the those are the things that will matter in a bigger project. So that's something that I should really focus on. You know what's also interesting about that is like I think about our books, right? Kin is such a big kind of um, topic. Uh, unusual unicorns. The way I was doing it, it could be anything, mm -hmm. right? With a horn. Um, <laughs> when when I was doing like uh, Water Worlds, that book. This is a while back. I really learned a lot about aquatic life just from doing that art book. This one, what did I really learn about? you know, through painting a whole bunch of unusual unicorns? Not much. I'd have to say not much. The The thing I really learned about was, like, horns. <laughs> right? Because yeah. that's the common thing. Uh -huh. So f how does this kind of help people listening and stuff? Well, one is you want to get really good on a constant Start making an art book or start making a series of paintings and drawings where it's really focused on a topic, right? And if you pick something like, kind of like 
family or unusual unicorns, then that might not be the best topic because it's so broad. Uh, and if I was going to do another book later on, I think I would do something a lot more specific, you know, like Lizard World or something like that. You know, I'm just really delving into and figuring out mm -hmm. where are all these lizards all about. <laughs> that makes sense. Instead of a book that's just like ghosts or aliens, it's something a little bit more specific in that category, right? Well, even ghosty stuff, I think the thing that you would learn would be... Um, you know, making things glow, mm. things that, mm. things to do with transparency and different ways of kind of illustrating transparency, glow, fogginess, stuff like that. Um, that would be specific in a lot of ways. That's yeah, cool. yeah. I think that's actually a good topic. Hmm. You can have that one. You're welcome. But if you, <laughs> <laughs> but if you made a book, say, uh, this is my happiness book you're probably not going to learn very much. You might mm -hmm. learn about how to kind of express smiles differently. I think that would probably be the main thing I would learn mm -hmm. from that. But otherwise, I wouldn't be learning that much, I don't think. That's interesting. That makes sense because um, honing in on those things is what you'll take forward into other jobs. And that's, that's what's really great because now at least you're a horn expert, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> If you have any horn questions, <laughs> I'm the horn guy. Yeah, there you are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so horns cool. are really cool, though. You know, like I've found out um, a narwhal, you know, the ones with the unicorn horn that kind of comes out. Mm -hmm. That's a tooth. That's not a horn. That's a tooth? Yeah. What? <laughs> it... That's so weird. Yeah. That's... A tooth. Uh, I, I I should check that again just because it's kind of like off the top of my head in the back of my mind kind of thing. Mm. But um, yeah, you do your own research and you could uh, you can prove me wrong in the YouTube comments. <laughs> <laughs> it's like not a, a tooth; it's a fingernail. Yeah, yeah that's weird. exactly. I got another good question here. Uh, we talked a lot about the right ways to study art. Um, Marsht LOL asked, do you think there's a wrong way to study art? And do you think there should be like a balance between your imagination work and studies? But I really like that idea of like, what would you say would be something not to do or that would be kind of taking yourself down the wrong path? Uh, uh, just off the top of my head, studying something too quickly, not really putting in enough effort or time uh, patience into it and then you move on going man it's not for me you know I couldn't do it um, you got to put in the effort uh, and the other thing is when you study a lot from one artist and then that's it that's like the worst because you will be a rundown version of that artist you gotta mm. spread it around you gotta spread it around and by the way um, I'm just gonna make a plug here whatever okay because it's a good one the summer sale schoolism only has two sales a year this one is a big one you save a hundred dollars off of annual subscription so now you can get a subscription for under two hundred dollars and it's it's all you need for the entire year you know 25 courses i believe now over 200 lessons um for an entire year and you save a hundred bucks if you get it now to before um, I think yeah the sale ends August third two thousand eighteen so definitely check that out and uh, while I'm at it I hope it's okay I just wanted to mention two events one is Copenhagen September fifteenth to sixteenth there is gonna be such a cool group of artists there. From Carlo Ortiz, Tuna Bora, Claire Wendling, Helen Mingju Chen, Eliza Ivanova, Alexandra Boyga. This is like, this is a pretty darn good all star team. Um, so that's going to be happening. And then after that, I'm heading to Dublin. 20th, 21st, Stefan Martinier, Shannon Tyndall, The Black Frog, Igor Alban Chevalier. I love saying his name. <laughs> Uh, Sylvain Mark, Megan Brain, and Nathan Fowkes are going to be there. 
that's going to be awesome. And you know what? It's just a good reason to travel and live life, right? Live life and experience life and mm-hmm. kind of gain that, gain that experience and let it come out of your brush. Yeah, it's going to be like exciting. It. Um, sorry. So the question was, what are some of the things that you don't want to do when you're studying? Do you have any? I had, a, I had, I had one recently too. Uh, copying what I see without really understanding what I'm drawing. That's, mm. a, that's a bad habit that I developed, I, I think, over the years. And then I, but I try to, I, I make an effort to catch myself doing that. I think it happens especially when, when, it, when I'm struggling or when I'm frustrated. So I just put it down on paper and try to understand it, but I'm not really making an effort to really break it down what like what is the main shape what is like this the lights the shadows and all that so. yeah you know uh and cautionary thing for everybody listening is that when you paint or draw something that you don't fully understand anybody that does fully understand it will know that you don't hmm mm-hmm. You know so what, what I mean? So like you're drawing a person. You don't fully understand anatomy. I can look at your, the muscles that you're drawing there and going, I can see the beginning of that muscle. I can see the end of that muscle. But they don't actually connect because you don't actually know that they're supposed to connect. Oh. Like that kind of stuff. Or that muscle looks like it's flexing, but he's not really, you know, that person is not really flexing that muscle right now doing that movement. Things like that. You have to have that same level of fluency that that other artist had that you're you're trying to emulate, right? Like that level of deep understanding that they have, you're just not going to get there by just tracing it without thinking about it. Well, and that's one of the things about um, why a lot of artists stick to the quick paintings, you know, the speed paintings. It's because they don't know enough about what they're actually painting to finish it. Mm. I'm just yeah. saying, just saying, prove me wrong. You know what I mean? Uh, there are a lot of really brilliant, brilliant uh, speed paintings, though, where I look at them like, yeah, that person knows exactly what they're doing. Because you can tell. You can still tell. There's some artists out there that only do kind of like speed kind of paintings. And I, hey, I could tell that they don't really know uh, everything about what they're painting. Yeah, there's a floor there where the, there are there's a, a level of where it doesn't get any deeper and that's unfortunate. But yeah. let's, let's pull yeah. the, the artists up a little bit because, uh, you know, all of a sudden people are like, okay, then I shouldn't paint much. Right. Mm-hmm. I need to fully understand it all or whatever. Uh, no, it just, you can just try to paint stuff, try to draw things that you understand. So, it doesn't mean, oh, I don't understand an elephant, so I'm not going to draw it. It could mean I'm going to simplify uh, the style of this because I don't understand the texture that much of an elephant, perhaps, right? And then you could do a beautiful, like, jungle book drawing of, the, of an elephant, and it looks beautiful, but it doesn't actually talk that much about the texture, not to, like, not to the nth levels anyways, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I must say, were you going to say something? Did I just step on you there? No, no, no. I have, I have another great viewer question here. Audrey asked about making a personal art book. Um, it has character and there's this story world. It is as a senior thesis project. Do you think a couple of school semesters is enough time to make a strong art book? And I asked this question. I really like that she brought that up because I'm curious about the timeline and development of a book like this and what you guys think that people should be thinking about when they're going to put together a book in that way. Yeah. Like what I would be thinking about is the long goal. Like, Mm -hmm. okay. The thing about being in school is all of a sudden, a lot of times, not everybody, but a lot of people, they feel like, oh, now their whole entire world is all about school. Right. And, um, once they're out of school, it's like getting put into another dimension just like that. And you're like, whoa, where am I? You know, and like, (laughs) 
You don't know where you are. You don't know where to go. You don't know how to navigate. You might not have any clothes on or whatever, like Terminator. It's just a big mess. <laughs> you got to be aware of that next step. The more aware you are of that next step of becoming professional, then it makes the transition so much easier. Right? I remember, Masse, you were doing like conventions and stuff as a student, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. See, I wish I did that because I didn't. I, I waited until I graduated, did that. And, you know, it's very clunky in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say. Number one is to think about, um, think about things as your career. So can you make an art book in two semesters? I'd say yes, but maybe it's just a 16 page art book. You know, it's like, well, what kind of book is that? Well, it's the beginning of a really good book. So, you know, put the back cover on it, say it's 16 pages, and then have the plan to make a whatever amount of pages for this beautiful art book the way that you want it, right? Because it's far better to make an amazing art book out there and put it out there in the world, even if it's like a half a year after you graduated or a whole entire year after you graduated, and have everybody going, wow, I really love this book. Uh, instead of putting out you know, a 50-page art book at the end of your school year, and it's mediocre, and it's rushed. You know, how many times, I don't know how many times you guys probably heard this, but like, I hear artists just going, oh yeah, I got to rush this thing for Comic-Con. I got to rush this thing for you know whatever <laughs> event. I just don't like that. I don't know. I forget yeah, what the it, question was. But, oh, yeah, it's about the art book, right? And just the, the time that goes into it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. We roughly spent seven months. We, yeah, we spent seven, seven freaking months, yeah, seven right? Full months. We really took our time. Like, out, we, especially outside of work hours, we really worked on. Mm -hmm. Just because it, it, it was our personal artwork. And so this is an addition to all the work you're doing during the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's while awesome. we're working on films or putting together workshops or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, it's important. I kind of miss it. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been bugging well, you probably... about it. I've been bugging you about it. Let's do it again. <laughs> yeah. It's probably a big change to have all that like work to do and then it kind of switches over and you're like, okay, well, mm -hmm. we wrapped that up. That's cool. What, how do you break up the work? On a book like that like i mean oh would you sketch out the whole book and then start on the paintings uh would you do them one at a time i guess it's a different style for everybody but what worked for you two i had my book she had hers that yeah. was it <laughs> yeah um but like Kay and i we worked on stuff together before um i i'm not the best person to ask about collaboration with paintings, even though I have had many collaborations before. For me, I'm just a very easygoing person uh, when it comes to collaboration. So it's like, if you want to draw it and you want me to paint it, fine. If you want me to draw it and you want to paint it, fine. And however you paint it, it's going to be fine with me. That's just how I am. So, and the other thing is that Kay is really good at art direction and just has a super good eye for everything so i generally i just listen to her uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah i just when she tells me to start some things over which has happened in the past me too. i don't fight it i do not fight it at all yeah. that's hilarious yeah k in k we trust right mm -hmm. yeah pretty much i guess also what i'm asking is like how did you break the work down into little into smaller chunks mm. oh okay well um i guess you want to talk about like making thumbnails and stuff like yeah that. sure um so the way we started it is well after we got our main um idea down like the theme of the book uh we broke it down into how many how many pages do we want it so we broke it down to 72 little thumbnail uh pages um on photoshop and then within there if we came up, or for me, when I came up with an idea, I would just like literally scribble something down into the little thumbnail. It's literally like this small. And then <laughs> as long as the idea is there, idea's there, I kind of let it sit. And then, 
you know, I go on to the next thumbnail. And I, for me, it's better to have, I liked it when I had a bunch of ideas that I can work off of, depending on, you know, it also depends on my mood, on which, you know, I want to work on this painting tonight, or I want to do this drawing instead. So I think that really helped me rather than, you know, putting my full focus on one thing at a time because then that kind of feels daunting in a way. Mm -hmm. So that Do you was... like you like working on multiple things? Mm, I think knowing that I have multiple ideas, if the first, if this sketch fails and the painting fails, then I was like I would think, Oh, okay, I have another idea that can kind of, you know, cover for that. So mm. I think that's where I felt you know, less, uh, where I felt the project was less daunting. You know what? Like, I've learned recently that because I'm doing so many things with running the studios, you know, helping with the workshops, the online stuff, uh, like a million things, that it's actually kind of challenging for me to just have one thing on my plate and concentrate on it mm -hmm. for, like, eight hours. Yeah. You have that as well, or? Yeah. Because yeah. I'm very much used to um, constantly switching gears. Every hour, every two hours, I'm just like switching gears to work on something else. Um, but, you know, a lot of people are going to be like, well, what about that thing where you're always on thinking about this one thing? I'm just talking about, um, yeah, it doesn't work if I'm on two films. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about like switching gears from a film to, you know, workshops to... Uh, online school or whatever it is that gets a lot um, easier for me and and I think more effective too because I'm able to do a lot of stuff mm. yeah because you can go at it fresh like you're not doing going from one painting to another painting right you're going from a painting to workshop planning and it's like a kind of a break from painting and you're approaching something new like just totally fresh right does that make sense um, yeah, it makes, it makes perfect sense, but I, I think it's just more like I want to switch gears. I just, after like an hour or uh, two, I get kind of antsy and I start thinking about some other stuff and I just want to switch gears. That makes sense. What about you? Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just asking like, like, what about you? Like, how do you feel about that idea of like switching gears? Does that work for you as well? Yes, it definitely does. And then not only that um once i kind of put my my attention somewhere else coming back to the painting i noticed so many things that i didn't notice at the time and then i kind of like step you know take a few steps back and then rework it so i think that's that really helps me in terms of uh going the direction i want to go with my paintings that's a, okay that hey that makes sense i have a uh, uh, i have there's like three or four people who have been asking about anatomy in this one. Sure. So, folks, I'm going to try to sum up the three or four different questions about anatomy. Um, how do you go about practicing anatomy? Um, what kind of tools do you think there are out there where people can get a little bit better with anatomy? Um, can you just speak to, speak to us about learning more about anatomy for a minute? We would like to hear about that. Yeah, uh, I actually remember exactly how I got better at anatomy. And uh, it was from, of course, going life drawing. You know, you have this posed model there. And I wouldn't just go and draw the model, but I would bring an anatomy book as well. And as I'm drawing the longer poses, I would try to draw out all the muscles and exactly how they would be if this guy or this girl didn't have any skin on, right? And just draw muscle anatomy, like hardcore uh, anatomy drawings of those poses to really start to understand. Because um, you kind of need both. You, you can memorize all the muscles in an anatomy book, but then you look at maybe like an older person that's really skinny. And now they got muscles that are like ribbon thin, right? And it's like, how do I find those muscles that I was studying in the anatomy book? How do they translate over? A lot of times it's super hard to figure that out, especially if there's a lot of fat as well, right? And fat covering somebody, or even worse, like fat covering somebody that has very little muscle. <laughs> then it's like, what are you really looking at there? Uh, so yeah, that becomes very helpful. 
um, to bring the anatomy book, you know, and going drawing with that anatomy book. And then the other thing uh, that Robert Valley said, Robert Valley, the Oscar nominee, super killer artist and animator and filmmaker, um, he said that when he did, uh, when he did life drawing, he would then bring the drawings home and try to rotate the poses. Whoa. Yeah, that's hardcore. That's really Jeez. hardcore for sure. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I never wow. thought of doing that. That's yeah. ninja level right there. Yeah, and then um, the last thing I would say, maybe you, you want to mention this. We kind of discovered this not too long ago. Yeah, Anatomy 360. It's uh, If you go search Anatomy 360 on Google, you, the first page that will come up is well, an anime 360. It's uh, it's a real 3D reference for artists. So there's different packages, where um, we got the hand. We package. got a bunch of them, yeah. And we're you know we're not affiliated with these people. We think they're awesome, but mm -hmm. we're not affiliated with them. Uh, we just like using their stuff. And what it is is like you get these models, in poses or whatever, uh, and you can rotate them. 360 mm -hmm. you know it's a computer uh, really cool. generated model so the lighting is a little stiff it's a little stylized or whatever it's a little computerized but the thing about it is that you can move it you can rotate it and you can look at it from any angle not just um rotating it from like on a disc or something you can go upwards mm -hmm. over top of the thing and look downwards at it you know you can also change the lighting which is super yeah. important as well. Like the spotlight Jeez. and the, the backlight as well. So you can get little rim lights and then it really helps with a certain, like if you want to get a certain lighting in your painting, then you just, you know, rotate the head in a certain way, put the light in this way. It's like, oh, I see this uh, mm -hmm. cast shadow. So I'm going to put that, apply that into my painting. So it's actually been super helpful because sometimes you, you think you understand it, but you, like, once it's actually in front of you, you're like, oh, okay, this is how I apply it. Yeah, and I love how you can change the lighting yeah. however you want. You can make it more intense. You can make it less intense. You can add a light. Or I don't know if you can add a light, but you, you have a key light, and then you have your general ambient light mm -hmm. that you can mess around with. It's, it's really cool, and it's quite cheap. You know, you don't have to actually buy a program they should totally pay me for this I'm really <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. but yeah you don't have to buy a program to run it it's its own That's program cool. you mm -hmm. just buy this cheap thing you you start it up and, and away you go I, I anatomy just, 360 yeah, is anatomy that what you said 360. anatomy 360 yeah. dot info mm. and that yeah. is the address boom yeah. right there I just like how you can like especially for the heads you can tilt it so you can see what it's like at a certain angle because mm -hmm. no matter how hard you look for that certain reference sometimes it's not there and it's like uh i just need that angle especially with like i don't know maybe an older man or like a younger younger man yeah especially like you know it's like you're not an old man <laughs> right it would be hard for you to kind of use the mirror and try to do a face and mm -hmm. be somewhat like what you want. Mm -hmm. It's going to be way off. So this allows you to be able to do that. And there's different races as well, which yeah. is like good on them because you don't really see that very often. There's Asian people. There's uh, you know black people, white people. Every it's 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 Diverse. great. Yeah, and it's yeah. old people, young people. They don't have any babies. Yeah. Which is kind of like, I would like a little 3D baby, I think. That'd be cool. That would be cool. <laughs> Paint from cherubs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, that was a I lot would... of advertising. <laughs> yeah, that was a huge <laughs> That was a very big, big plug there. That's good. They should, yeah. Uh, I want to ask another question about this, because I feel like a lot of people want to study anatomy. And I feel like having, like, literally sat next to you on the subway in Toronto, watched you draw like seeing what it looks like when you're drawing a guy in the subway, it's so much more about structure. And I think that's important to bring up. I would love to hear if you can explain a little bit about the difference between knowing structure 
and physical muscles and anatomy. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, sure. Structure is the thing that umbrellas it all. And I'll say that once again. Structure is the thing that <laughs> umbrellas it all. So what? why am I saying that twice? Because if you think about lighting, lighting describes structure. When you add color onto something, do you need to consider the structure? Yeah, you still need to consider the structure. Line drawings, drapery, anatomy. Anatomy all of a sudden becomes one tiny little spoke in the overall kind of um, structure wheel, so to speak, right? And then if that is one wheel, what is the vehicle? The vehicle is visualization. Now, what do I mean by that? It means like you can, you can describe structure. Uh, in you can describe so many different kinds of structure in so many ways. But you can also think about things in terms of tone, in terms of light, in terms of time. Like I'm going to draw this uh, mark first, this mark second, this mark third. And then the total will become this. All of those things um, are umbrellaed by visualization. So visualization is the hardest way and the most powerful way to think. I like it. That, that's like, I see this guy sitting over there and I want to draw that guy. Um, but instead of focusing so much on that person sitting there and getting every detail, I'm supposed to visualize what I want that drawing to look like on the paper, right? Uh, yeah, let me break it down to you. So if I'm looking at you, you're on the subway, um, I would be looking at you going, okay, where is the anatomy? And then I would visualize that. And then I would think about the drapery over top of the anatomy and visualize that before I draw it down so I don't have to draw a whole bunch of marks everywhere. And then whatever else I want to draw on top of that, I generally will visualize it first before drawing it down. I like that. That's a good process because it's easy to get hung up in muscles and, and realism of those things when maybe the artwork you want to create isn't, uh, that, isn't that dependent on an accurate anatomy as much as it is, like you said, just one spoke in the wheel. I think that's important to point out. Yeah, it's, it's also really good to know that, yeah, the hardest way, the most important, the most powerful way to think is through visualizing. You can mm -hmm. apply this literally to anything that you're thinking about. You know, like talking with your boss or your teacher or your parents. Uh, let me visualize it from their point of view first. You know, like even that. Uh, visualization is like this huge part of it. Just imagining how it's going to go ahead of time yeah. gives you like a, a dress rehearsal kind of in your head. Yeah, exactly. Um, there was this awesome letter where this this uh, this girl she she was writing from college back to her parents, and she was just like she failed, right? She failed her her course or whatever and that's horrible and so she's trying to write this letter to her parents and uh telling them about this failure and i, I she must have used visualizing because what she ended up doing was just genius she was just like i've loved it in college it's been amazing i met this guy he is great he's he's a you know starving mu musician and uh he plays the flute and you know i don't have all the details but this is somewhat <laughs> of the thing and we're in love and we've known each other for only a week but we feel like it's been for seven years and now we're gonna have a baby and it's gonna be wonderful a love baby and then before you freak out, none of this stuff is happening. Everything is good. Life is good. <laughs> the only thing is, is that I failed this one little course, but I love you and, you know, everything's good. <laughs> right? That was pretty cool. <laughs> that is some good forethought right there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome.
Yeah, that's a good way to put it in perspective, right? Oops. Mm-hmm. It can't be this bad. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what? I wanted to talk about this last thing before we go. Okay, something that um, I was discussing with the schoolism uh, students when I was abroad um, at these different workshops and stuff. I was like, I started, oh, this was in Tel Aviv, right? And I, I just started by just saying, Art is easy. Being an awesome artist, doing everything you want to do, it's easy. And this is why. All you got to know is that most people, they set these goals for six months or a year from now, and we usually overestimate what we can do. We can't actually do all those things in like six months or a year. But when we think in a lifetime, when we think in 10 years, 20 years, you can dream as, as high as you want to go. You can literally dream of like, I want to build the next Pixar in like 20 years. You can totally do that. Because the, the, um, when you have a big amount of time like that, we usually underestimate everything that we can do. You know, to put some perspective on it, right? Like schoolism has been around for 13 years. So 13 years ago, I was n- nobody. I was just sitting there at my, you know, in my uh, home slash studio, right? Mm-hmm. And just trying to figure things out and like, what am I going to do? Um, I never met anybody working in the field. I, I never worked on a movie at that time and all this stuff. And of course, you know, years later, I got to work on everything I want to work on. Somehow won an Emmy you know, worked at Pixar, worked at, you know, all these, worked for Tim Burton. I never, ever would have thought that that could happen in like 13 years. Okay, so that's number one, is like, if you say in your heart of hearts, this is my goal, this is my dream, and I will not stop until I get there, you'll get there way before 10 years. If you can say to yourself, Yes, I am willing to spend 10 years, 20 years to achieve this goal. You will never have to wait that long. Unless you're doing it wrong, you know, like unless you're you're not logically kind of constantly using your logic and thinking about it. There is the possibility of you trying to just run straight ahead without even thinking where you're going, which is not, you know, that's obviously not good. But um if you do have a bit of logic on your side, not even a lot, just a bit, and you are also, um, you're also dreaming big, you'll do big and great things and you'll surprise yourself. The other part about this is uh, art is easy because we can all choose to go through the right door. Most of us go through that 99% door, which is, yeah, I'll do a little drawing here and there. Okay, that's enough, right? Uh, well, it's my weekend. On my weekend, I do fun stuff, and that doesn't include drawing, which is mm. insane. You know, um, oh, I just want to draw dragons and, you know, Sasquatches without really learning how life works and, you know, fundamentals and all that stuff. Right? That's the 99% door. Go through the 1% door. You don't need to be a six foot six. You don't need to be 330 pounds of pure muscle. You just need to be a person with eyes that can hold a pencil or whatever, and you're allowed admittance through this door. It's just that that door doesn't look very attractive in the beginning. It's full of thorns in front of it or whatever and it's not a smooth path because not a lot of people go down that path. They go down the path that's all beautiful, polished, super pleasant, super welcoming to go down. Don't fall for that trap. Instead, go down that 1%. So what is that 1% door? That's usually, for a lot of people, that's getting up early. That's getting up 5 o'clock in the morning. You know, the Tonko House guys, uh, Cody Gramstad, he kind of was trained on Tonko House, and he was like, they would get up 
five in the morning every day, not just the weekdays, every day to go plein air painting. And then they get into work at nine and they start working on their own stuff. Right? Nathan Fowkes is a person that highly uh, appreciates the fundamentals and constantly training. He has this thing where he painted like, I don't even know, it seemed like 200 paintings of the same scenery outside his window mm -hmm. every day right? Go through that 1% door. When you look at masters in galleries and museums, and then you see their preliminary sketches, and it's like a pile of them. There's like a literal, like 20 different sketches, 20 different little paintings before they did the big painting. And then you think about how many of those did you do before your painting? <laughs> and we aren't even close to that level. You know, that's what I'm talking about, the 1% door. Right? So if we choose every day to go through that 1% door instead of 99% door, I promise you art will be easy. Right? And I just wanted to kind of end it off like that. Um, and another huge one, of course, is you want to keep learning. Because especially when you graduate school, how many people stop learning and they go, oh, I'm just going to learn from my job. Yeah, you do learn from your job, but you'll learn way quicker when you're always taking lessons, when you're always studying, when you're always learning, right? And especially if you want to go through the 0.1% door, get really good at your art, have a really great career, and then keep learning. Mm -hmm. How many people do that? Zero. It's like so few people do that. So there you go. Art is easy. Go through the 1% door. <laughs> Uh, There's your takeaway. I like it. <laughs> I also want to mention, um, you know, thank you to everybody uh, tuning in and everything. But I also want to mention that I'm going to have an extremely awesome artist on the streams uh, on this Saturday. Why am I working on Saturday? Because I'm going through a 1% door, right? 1%. Armand Serrano, he is a killer. He is amazing. Uh He's going to be live on the streams Saturday, June 23rd from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, so join me for a live stream. And uh, don't forget about the summer sale because Schoolism, every time Schoolism has this awesome sale, every time it ends, I get a pile of emails going, I didn't know about the sale, I didn't know about the sale. <laughs> Get on the sale, I'm telling you. It's a good freaking sale. It's just like the Kickstarter. You know, all these people going, can I get another Unusual Unicorns book? It's like, no, there were literally 500, <laughs> you know? Strike while the iron's hot. Strike while the iron's hot, hot. If it makes sense to you, you got to do it. Or else you're not kind of doing justice for your life. That's, that's how I kind of feel, you know? So there you go, everybody. Art is easy, 1% door. Get on the Schoolism <laughs> sale. And I don't know what else except to thank uh, our wonderful audience and to thank you guys. Thanks, guys. Matt Johnson, Masei Seki. I'm Bobby Chu. See you guys next time. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.